this morning before we have our guest come to speak to us this morning in preaching the word. I want to introduce her to you. Her name is Carmen LaBerge, and some of you may have known her from your interaction being part of Church of Stanley in the PCUSA and her work. She was the former president of the Presbyterian Lay Committee that played an important role in, in helping churches through uh, many challenges and trials and situations. She's now a regular broadcaster on t uh, the radio every day at 12 noon. And I don't know if you're on bot radio here in Kansas City. Faith Radio, so I believe you can get it here in town, um, and you're able to hear at 12 noon at that time. Um, she has written a great book that I would highly recommend to you, and there's copies in the lobby afterwards in between services that you'll be able to get. It's called Speak the Truth, How to Bring God Back into Everyday Conversations. And that's what Carmen has been uh, doing through her work and her ministry, um, and the opportunity for us to see how do we engage as Christians in the middle of our culture now, we've just spent about seven weeks talking about what we need to be as a church, and so I think this is going to be a fitting end to our series, an opportunity for you to hear her speak today. So, Carmen, we welcome you. Thank you for coming and being a guest here today. Thank you so much, Helen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I'll keep the book up here. Oh, yeah. So I might... There we go. What a joy to be gathered together with the people of God in this place on this day. So thank you, church, for gathering in this place, and uh, I look forward as a member of the body of Christ to be deployed out there into the world that he so loves, to actually be his agents of grace and the ambassadors of his kingdom out there in the world. Uh, so it's one thing to gather as the church, it's another thing to be scattered, to be deployed as the church in the world. And so when, when we think about ourselves, um, one of the conversations that I hope we're always having in in our own minds is, you know, not just who am I, but who am I uh, on God's purpose or on God's mission in the world that he so loves? Because the answer to all of the identity confusion and the identity politics of our generation for Christians is actually answered in Christ. And so that's one of the things that we're going to uh, talk about today. Turn with me, if you will, and I think you can just do so right here in your bulletin. That's very handy. Um, turn with me to 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, and we're going to talk today about the ministry of reconciliation, which also means we under, need to understand ourselves as ministers of reconciliation. So the next time somebody asks you who's your minister or who are the ministers at your church, you need to say, well, I am among them. I am one of the ministers of Cornerstone." If you don't already think of yourself as a minister of the body of Christ that God gathers here in this place and then deploys into the world that he so loves, you have a misunderstanding of ministry. That guy right there is not the minister. He's the pastor. You're the ministers. So that's part of what I'm going to uh, set before you as a challenge today in terms of the way we individually and corporately think about ourselves and what we understand we're in the world to do. Reading uh, from the ESV, beginning at verse 11 of chapter 5 of Paul's second letter to the Christians in the church at Corinth, this is the word of the Lord. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But we... But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again, uh, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we're beside ourselves, the language there is out of our minds, if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. In this one passage of scripture, if you want to find it, in this one passage of scripture, you can know the answers to the three biggest questions that people in the culture are asking today. And frankly, three of the biggest questions that most of us are still asking day to day. Who am I? Where do I belong? And what in the world am I in the world to do? They're the questions of identity, belonging, and purpose. Peter actually offers the same answers that Paul offers to the same questions in a slightly different form in a very short text in the first letter of Peter. So 1 Peter 2.9 says, answering the identity question, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The belonging question, a people belonging to God. And a what in the world am I in the world to do answer, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So if you want a one-verse answer to the three biggest questions that people in the culture are asking today, your one-verse answer to the question is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You and I do not have to wonder who we are. We don't have to wonder where we fit. And we don't have to wonder what in the world we're in the world to do. God has actually already told us. And he's already given us everything that we need to accomplish his will. So if you are sitting on the sidelines of anything, you are doing so by your own choice. Not because God has not already revealed his will, and not because he hasn't already given you everything that you need to do to accomplish his will in the world. If we're on the sidelines, it's because we are choosing to be on the sidelines. And my encouragement today is that you actually make a different choice about that. And you say, you know what? I don't want to be on the sidelines anymore. I'm tired of being on the sidelines. I want to be in the game. I want to actually be actively in the mission that God is advancing his kingdom mission in the midst of the kingdoms of this world. I actually want the world to be different and I know how to make it so because I know the one who in Christ Jesus is reconciling the world to himself. I know the message of reconciliation. I know the gospel. And I want other people to know it as well. So no matter what you're doing, I mean, literally, no matter what you're doing, what you're doing as a vocation, what you're doing as an avocation, what you're doing in what the world likes to call retirement, which has really no biblical meaning, no matter what you're doing, as a Christian, if you know who you are and you know to whom you belong, and you understand that being reconciled to God is not just for your own benefit, but that you might then turn and be a minister of reconciliation, an actual ambassador of the kingdom of heaven in the midst of the kingdoms of this world, then you won't just pray phrases like, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, without understanding that when you pray it, you're also deploying yourself into the mission of making it so.
Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, in word and in deed, do it all to the glory of God. Do these passages sound familiar? My guess is that you're familiar with what God has said in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. My guess is you have been sitting and soaking for a fairly long period of time, many of you. It's time for all of that which has been soaked up over many years to now be squeezed out in a ministry of reconciliation in a world that is broken and dying to know what you already know. You guys have actually, I mean, if you think about your own story as a congregation, you are actually already a marvelous living demonstration of God doing a new thing, of God uh, exhibiting a reconciling uh, love, of God bringing together a very uh, diverse body of believers from different places and different histories and putting them together to do a new thing. Does this sound familiar when you think about the narrative of your own congregational life? And do you understand that each and every one of you is an integral part of that body and that the body can't function here as a church, local congregation, nor deployed into the world that God so loves unless you guys actually know one another well enough to know that in this congregation right now, you have people with missional experience in ministries related to justice, ministries related to mercy, ministries related to education, ministries related to health care, ministries related to prison, ministries, I mean, on the receiving end of it or on the doing end of it, you already have, God has already brought into this body of believers ministers who are ready to lead other ministers into ministries of reconciliation in this city and beyond. If you're saying to yourself, well, I know who she's talking about when she's talking about ministries of justice, and I know who she's talking about when she's talking about ministries of education, then you need to actually get together with that person and say, it's time for us to go. We've been told to go. We've been told we're supposed to go. We know we're supposed to go. It's time to go. You got out. You got healthy. Now it's time to go. Do you get it? Do you get that? Okay. How do we get from where we are, sort of the knowledge that these are the things that we're supposed to do, that this is who we're supposed to be, um, to actually doing it? I had a church member once who, after what she considered a very inspiring sermon, said to me at the door, where's the bus? I said, what? Her name's Patty, she now lives in Wyoming. She said, I'm ready. You're, you've convinced me. I'm totally ready. Where's the bus? I said, what? <clears throat> Some people are sitting here ready to go. But unless somebody else goes and gets the bus and pulls it up out front and says, get on the bus, we're going downtown, I know where the homeless people gather. I know I, I have sat with them before at table fellowship. You won't die. I'll go with you the first time. Come on. Like, I get it that there are people here right now who would do it if the bus were pulled up out front that you could just get on and go. So, if you're the person who who already knows, you're feeling convicted right now because you know that you are the prison ministry person. You know that you're the homeless ministry person. You know that you're the educational ministry person that knows how to engage with local uh, leaders in public education and how to actually do that. Or you know how to do social, you know you're the social justice ministry person. Like, you already know it instinctively. Do not wait for one more person to pull up the bus. Go get a bus. <laughs> Be the person who says, all right, this week we're collecting these things. Be the person who has one of these in next week's bulletin that says, all right, here's the bus for the next thing. Whatever it is. You know what the number one uh, request at homeless shelters is across America? Number one, I learned this from an advertisement for Bombas, 
which is a sock company. So that kind of gives away the answer to the question. <laughs> this is an excellent marketing strategy on their part because I learned something missional from a for-profit sock company called Bombas. So where do you think I get my socks now? I get my socks from them because I actually know that every pair of socks I buy from them, they give a pair of socks to a homeless center. Why? Because it's the number one requested item at homeless shelters across America. How many times did you change your socks this week? How did you wash the ones you wore? Homeless people cannot give that answer to that question that you just gave. And when you start thinking about putting on the same pair of socks on the fifth or sixth or seventh or twelfth or fourteenth day, suddenly you're going to say, when are we having a sock drive? You're going to say to yourself, socks is something we can do. Do you see how actually easy it is if you just start thinking missionally instead of just thinking that church is about coming into this place on Sunday morning and doing what we're doing now? This is part of it, but the part of it that this is is really small because God wants all of it. All of it. God made it all new. God didn't reconcile to you, to himself, through Jesus Christ, so that he could get an hour. Or so that he could get 10%. Or 2%. Or whatever. God reconciled you to himself in Jesus Christ so that he could make you 100% through and through new. A new creation. And having bought all of you with the blood of Christ, he now expects to get to use all of you for the advancement of his kingdom purposes. Which means, I don't, you know, go to work for these hours and, well, God's not a part of that. And I go to the gym and God's not a part of that. And I go to stuff that's related to kids and God's not a part of that. Because, you know, I checked off the God box when I went to church. No, there's no God box. There's God being, there's God belonging, there's, there's the mission of God that you're a part of. There's no box to check off. And oh, by the way, if you are waiting for somebody else to do it, whatever it is, Guess what? You are the somebody who God sent. Have you ever played a game of tag? You're it. So um, my, in my family, this concept of, um, of being the somebody that got sent, th this was not ingrained in me as a Christian idea. This was ingrained in me um, by a mom who used to say to my sister and I, when something that needed doing and should have gotten done hadn't, I know that never happens in your house, but I can, I can actually still hear my mom saying this. We called it the who body recitation after a while, after we'd heard it enough times. But here it is. I, could, I now should probably call it the somebody recitation. Here's how it went, or roughly so. Once upon a time, there was a family of who bodies. Their names were everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Everybody noticed somebody, uh, something needed doing. Somebody told everybody to do it. Everybody said that anybody could do it. Anybody thought it was somebody's job, but somebody left it to anybody. In the end, nobody did it. Everybody was upset because nobody did what anybody could have done and somebody should have. Now, at this point, my mother would pause. My sister and I would look at each other. By the end of the Who Body recitation, we were already like silently negotiating who was going to do what anybody could have done and somebody should have. She would wrap it up this way. Everybody pays the price if nobody does what anybody could do and somebody must. And in this family, everybody is a somebody. So figure out which one of the two of you is going to do it because if nobody does it, everybody is going to wish that somebody had. <laughs> I 
in the body of Christ, you are the somebody. You're the somebody who, you know, just happened to be in that particular place at that particular time when that particular person found themselves in that particular need. You are the deployed people of God in the world. You don't get to retire from that. Maybe you say to yourself, my days are consumed with simply you know, going down the list, and the list changes over time. It changes as we age, what's on the list and who's on the list and the things that have to be accomplished on the list, but everybody has a list. My mom's 80, my stepdad's 85, they still have a list. Now their list now is that they go to a series of doctor's appointments and they go and they check on various and sundry things. But every single one of those places is a mission outpost. Because you can either be a patient who is exhibiting kingdom principles, or you can be that really hard person that nobody wants to see coming. You can be the person that's there to bless the staff of the office and be a living demonstration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can be the one who says, you know what, I don't fear death because I actually know, I actually know more people on that side than I know on this side anyway, and the people on this side, eh. <laughs> Like, you can actually help other people look forward instead of always looking back. I'm just saying that it doesn't really matter what age and stage in life you're in. You have a ministry. You have a ministry opportunity. Has anybody, this is, again, I know that, you know, we're just all figuring it out. But there's a lot of people with a lot of church experience in this room. I mean, you guys are a new church plant, but it's not like you're a new church plant of a bunch of people that have never been in church before. Right? So, if somebody calls the phone number for this church, do you know who answers the phone? An answering machine. Now, let me just tell you, there is somebody probably sitting here right now who loves to talk on the phone, who loves to answer a phone, who's got some time on their hands. Do not wait for somebody to go down a list and say, hey, could you come, because this is the wrong language, by the way. If anybody ever call, calls and asks you to volunteer at something at church, you need to scold them. You need to say, our church doesn't have volunteers. We have members in ministry actively engaged in their right way as members of the body of Christ, each doing their part. It's not volunteer service if it's at the church of which you are an integral body part. It's you functioning like you're supposed to function. Otherwise, by the way, it's at least dysfunctional and at worst, totally paralyzed. You are not a volunteer if you are doing your function as a part of the body of Christ. So I don't know if you guys use that language here, but I would really encourage you to eliminate it. If it's in your vocabulary, get rid of it. The church doesn't have any volunteers. The church has redeemed members of a body, people who've been reconciled to God in Jesus Christ, who know the gospel, who are seeking together to publicly advance the gospel always and in all ways. That's who we are, and that is what we are in the world to do. I'm hoping that at some point you're going to have this little aha moment that's like, oh, we don't have a staff of 15 people here who, you know, we've like divvied up the pie and we've hired a bunch of folks to do a bunch of things and they then run committees who then just get together but don't actually do anything anyway. And then eventually you get far enough into the outer bands of our really big church and the people who haven't ever done it before, we've convinced them to do it. No. That was bad body theology when we did it that way, and it's bad body theology now. So, we're going to begin embracing the reality that actually we are the ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think for a moment about what that means. I want you to think for a moment about how you would hold yourself and how you would present yourself if you had the title of ambassador. 
What if you had the title of minister? Anybody in here? You guys do Stephen's ministry? Stephen ministry? You got some Stephen ministers in here? Okay. How does it change your perception of yourself when you walk into the hospital or you walk into uh, an opportunity to communicate with somebody and you actually have a name tag or you have a calling card that actually identifies you as a minister? It changes our perception of who we are and it changes everybody else's perception of us as well. So if you're, you know, maybe you're retired and you sort of miss having a business card, print some up. Put on there that I'm a minister of Cornerstone Church because you are. I know, now I'm probably going to get in all kinds of trouble with Sheldon, but <laughs> you're going to go from having like the perception of one minister to hundreds because that's really what we are. So I went from ordained ministry to please take away my ordination because I, I, I can't be ordained in the body that is doing what it's doing, to now being a member of a, a totally complementarian denomination that would, would not appreciate describing what I'm doing now as preaching. So they just think I'm at a church talking today. So, <laughs> which is totally fine. Here's the reality. I know who I am. I know what I'm in the world to do. And it doesn't matter that I do or do not have some certificate of ordination by some body here on this terrestrial ball to say you're an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven because guess what? I, I've already got it in the book that matters from the guy who matters. And so do you. Have you ever met an ambassador? Now that's kind of a trick question after I've just said, right, what I've said. But if you've ever met, like, you know, and don't say a real ambassador, because this is where the world tricks us up, right? But if you've ever met a person who has actually served on behalf of one nation as an ambassador to another nation, or if you have ever met a person who serves as an ambassador of the United States to the United Nations, let me tell you, these are people who are dignified. And they hold themselves um, as, as understanding that they represent something bigger than themselves. Something great. Something about which they want other people to know. When we talk about being ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, we need to know what the kingdom of heaven is like. We certainly need to know the king. And we need to be spending all of our energy, all of the time, no matter what else we're doing, as we go, we are ambassadors of that kingdom. So in your workplace, whatever else you're doing, you're also an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. In your garden club or your card club or whatever you know, club you're up to this week, in that group of people, whatever else you are, you are also an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. Do you see how we get beyond the identity politics of our day and beyond the identity confusion of our day and beyond the identity theft, which, by the way, is what the enemy is always trying to do, which is rob us of who we really are as image bearers of the living God and children of God and people who are reconciled to God and new creations deployed as ministers of the gospel um, and ministers of reconciliation and agents of grace, identity theft, that's what the enemy is up to today in America. He's trying to rob us of our understanding of who we are. So don't let him do that. Be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom principles wherever you are, and as you go, make disciples. As you go. Make disciples. What do you have to be in order to make a disciple? This is not a trick question. The answer to the question is in the question. What do you have to be in order to make a disciple? A disciple. So disciples of Jesus Christ, as you go, which means don't make it harder than it is. 
it doesn't actually require a bus. It requires you and I, as we go, making disciples, which means we have to know other people, we actually have to engage them, we have to understand who they are, and then we, re we win the right to share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we know because it's our story. It's not four points that we have to memorize. It's a story that's in us that we have the privilege of telling. All right, I'm out of time. Who we are, hopefully the identity question has been answered, and hopefully you have latched onto one of those ideas. We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We are ministers of reconciliation. We are people made in the image of God, redeemed by God on purpose and for a purpose. Where do we belong? Well, we belong to a body of Christ. As we abide in Christ, Christ abides in us. We're members together, one with the other. Where do we belong? We belong to God, eternally. And what in the world are we in the world to do? Advance his kingdom purposes, always and in all ways. No matter where you are, no matter whatever else you're doing, you are the somebody that God sent into that moment to bring him glory and accomplish his will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.